Lord, it's coming, all right? Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. It is Saturday, which means that it's time for a brand new content report. First of all, today marks the very first week that I have managed to completely tap out my quota for the upload limit, meaning that you basically got 20 hours of production content and videos across all of my projects. And as a matter of fact, not only did I tap out the entire quota, I had plenty of footage left over. You have no idea how much cool stuff I had to leave out from this week's upload because I basically used up all of my upload quota. But this is actually good. This means that uh, performance-wise, I'm doing better than I expected and I have some extra videos to upload to the platform for next week should anything urgent happen. And this could actually mean that I may have under-evaluated how much free time I have, which is phenomenal because I have really been wanting to put more time towards reading anything and everything that has to do with script writing and storytelling. I mean, I can't wait to burn through some storytelling books. But in any case, let's go ahead and take a look at all the new content and goodies available on the platform. Tag Rise. My goodness, if there's a single project that I can attribute most of my experience to, it's this one. I have learned so much in completely failing and destroying and incorrectly programming so many features about this game. This project has gone from the development in GameMaker Studio 1.4, and then it has survived a migration to GameMaker Studio 2, where GameMaker Studio 2 offered so many cool new things that I thought, in the long run, it's going to be worth it porting this particular project to the new engine and continuing development there. Across the two versions of GameMaker Studio, I have probably remade this project maybe five times by now. And every single time I've done so, I made sure not to make any of the same mistakes I did before. And now that I look back on all that development time, the whole freaking project was more about learning than actually making the game. Now, don't get me wrong, the end goal is still a game. This game is supposed to propel our gaming channel, our little gaming venue called Retroactive Gamers. Retroactive Gamers is essentially an entertainment project which myself and my best friend Tim can have started together back in 2012, when we were both still attending high school. It was and still is essentially a gaming commentary channel. We looked up to channels like Game Grumps and Best Friends Play as a sort of goal or measuring stick to build our own slice of paradise around. And the whole idea behind building the channel was to leave some sort of a lasting historical mark or archive of the fun times we have playing games together. Think of it as a photo album or family video of uh, our gaming experiences. Less more about us creating an entertainment business per se and more about just uh, uh, something to come back to when we're old and uh, have some laughs over the stupid shenanigans we would say during recording. Ever since then, the project has grown in scope and our ambitions evolved into trying to achieve bigger things for the Retroactive Gamers project. And one of the things we thought would be fun to do is create a video game evolving around the Retroactive Gamers characters. That would be Tim and myself. Essentially, the game was supposed to be used as some sort of a promotional material or a little piece of media which we would use to push the channel with. Essentially, through the game, expose people to the venue that is Retroactive Gamers. Tim and I would voice our own characters playing as ourselves in this post-apocalyptic survivor story. And the game itself was inspired by the game called Super Meat Boy that was released in 2008. At the time, and to this day, Super Meat Boy still does not have a co-op mechanic in it. And yes, I know about Super Meat Boy forever, and I refuse to call whatever the hell they're trying to implement with that turn-based mechanic actual co-op. Super Meat Boy does not have co-op, so I thought but hey, what if I create a game like Super Meat Boy, all the same challenges, all the same mechanics, except it would incorporate the Retroactive Gamer's most favorite game feature, which is local co-op, two controllers, split screen or one screen, as long as two players are playing at the same time. That kind of co-op. And thus, our tag rise was born. Now, as I said earlier, this game has gone through a lot of versions and uh, 
two engine migrations, not to count the several times I had started this project over because of, uh, well, a lot of things have been learned and a lot of realizations have been made that a lot of things have been programmed very terribly. As the project went along, it has been growing and evolving. Instead of a simple set of levels, it now has a story and a plot with characters. Instead of a simple linear path, it is now a semi-open world quest-based game. Instead of Tim and I being the only characters in the game, we now have several protagonists, which all have their own personal character arcs as well as share the place in the grand story. So the scope of the whole game has grown quite a bit since its conception and ever since I started working on the concept bay platform with all of the projects that I record content for, I technically have had time to work on this project. It is on my schedule. I've split up my daily routine to make sure that I put some time into this project on a weekly basis. However, I still prioritize the content for the platform before this project, mainly because the content on the platform is essentially sort of the mini business that I'm trying to build. It is my Patreon, so to speak. It is my source of income, or at least that's what I am building that towards. So the content that I create for the platform gets prioritized over any personal or outside of the scope of the platform projects. And I am honestly not very thrilled about the amount of uh, progress I've made on this project, considering this technically is my flagship game. This is the main project that uh, I pride myself in. And after some contemplation, I figured that the only way I can contribute more time into this project, the Retroactive Gamers official game, is to make it a part of the Concept Bay platform. This project that you can see in front of you has been made in GameMaker Studio 2. However, with the growth of scope and the addition of 3D models for some of the antagonists and environments, I actually think that now it is time to migrate it to Godot. Considering that Godot has been showcasing the exact feature set I need to achieve what it is that I envision for this game. One of the criticisms I got for this is that uh, Game Maker Studio can do 3D and you can achieve this in Game Maker Studio. You just got to use community made assets and plugins and whatnot to get that up and running. And yes, you can do that. But uh, through my experience, Godot already offers to it right out of the box. I don't need to install anything. I don't need to finagle with any plugins. It's just there. So in the scope of the project, the project is more important. The engine, not so much. I have to prioritize the tools that will finish this project the fastest. And if some community members from engine A or engine B are gonna get butthurt because their favorite engine is not being used, then so be it. The project is all that matters. So as of this moment, I officially make Artag Rise the project a part of the Concept Bay platform, which means that the progress I've done so far migrating this project to Godot Engine will basically be nullified. I will open up a brand new project and I will start the porting over. I will start the porting process over, this time, however, recording every step of the way so that you, the Concept Bay members, can benefit from learning from the experiences which I have gotten from making and remaking this project oh so many times. Yes, I am already involved in three different projects. Dream Team Theater, Child of Ether, and Accursed Kingdom. This project technically would not be taking away anything from those games already because I was already working on this project as a part of my schedule. So time-wise, not a whole lot is changing. The only thing that is changing is that now I press record whenever I work on this project. Now, in terms of the starter content, since uh, most of my time this week has been put towards the other three projects and uh, the decision to convert this to a The Concept Bay platform project, the very first development episodes primarily concentrates on the setup of the project, basic inputs, and figuring out the tile and sprite scaling, something that's been a thorn in my side and the side of this project ever since conception. Picking the wrong size of tile, which uh, 
essentially just limits and defines your artwork resolution for the whole of future development. The entire episode is basically all about setting up the basics and figuring out what the tile scale should be and how we're going to define the sizing for everything that's going to be drawn and animated for this project in the future. So if there was ever a better time to hop on the concept bay platform, it is now right in the beginning of the project's development where you can follow the project along as we develop it on the platform. And on the side note, if you're interested in checking out the sort of content Tim and I put out for the Retroactive Gamers platform, head on over to RetroactiveGamers.com where you will find all the crazy shenanigans brought to you by Tim and Milo of Retroactive Gamers, all the games we'll play, as well as a few web-based mini-games that I've put up on the website specifically to provide some additional entertainment. These are games you can play right from within your browser. That is all I have for the Artag Rise project, so let's go ahead and move on to the next bit of content. We start off with Dream Team Theater by revamping the behavior of the zombies. This time the zombies uh, are actually being created from their designated spawn points and uh, their AI is currently programmed to first traverse the obstacle of getting out of the inaccessible area to the main level floor and only then begin to chase the player. Now currently the zombies, uh, they pre-calculate the passage, so that means there's a, a lag before they realize that the player is no longer in their initial destination. That is easy to fix by getting the recalculations to fire a bit more frequently and perhaps have a few more rules as to what constitutes the recalculation. But uh, other than that, we did get the enemies to first climb into the world and then start chasing the player. We then returned to Substance Painter to try to get a bit of a better brass look out of our brass drums and metal parts. And uh, to be honest, it still looks like a plate of hot shit. But at least I sort of have an idea of uh, where I need to go with this. The brass in Substance Painter looks a lot more like brass than it does in Gadot Engine. There's some sort of an inaccuracy or some sort of a compensation which I have yet to figure out. I have a suspicion that I probably need to get the base color more into the yellow, so it would look like gold in Substance Painter, but it would probably look like brass in Gadot Engine. And what it looks like in Gadot Engine is the most important bit. In the following episode, we spent some time designing, modeling, texturing, and animating the loot crate, which drops from the loot crate chute at the top of the ceiling of the first level. All the modeling, animation, UV mapping is done in Blender, and all the texturing is done in Substance Painter. There's a lot of uh, generators that I've used to get the wear and tear effect just right, lots of different paints and chips, as well as emission maps to get uh, the little light up areas to indicate where the crate is located in the darkness. We spend the next few episodes doing the animations and setting up the rig, and I have to say, I love animating mechanical movement. There's so many bounces and twists and little action wind-ups that you could make just to sell the mechanical feel of the whole rig. It's just such a therapeutic pleasure to animate mechanical things. In the end, I would say that the end result has pretty much met my expectations. The crate falls pretty nicely, although there's a bit of a scaling delay that I gotta fix, and the opening animation with the light attached to it, oh man, it's got such a dark, grimy feel to it. I love it. Ultimately, the plan is to have the weapons, upgrades, and various nodes attached to the grates so you can pick them up at your disposal. And the whole crate is supposed to be this uh, mystery box gambling thing that you can find in the Nazi Zombies games where you spend a certain amount of currency and you get uh, some random item in the mystery box. Now I have to figure out how I'm gonna handle the weapon modeling because this sort of a game pretty much takes its uh, weapon RPG mechanics after Borderlands which offers a lot of weapons. So I think I'm gonna have to come up with some sort of a modular system. And with that, this is all the content that I have for the Dream Team Theater. Let's go ahead and move on to the next project.
For Child of Ether project, we continue developing the quest editor, the quest building tool that's built right into the game. At this point, I'm pretty confident that if I get the implementation just right, this would make for some pretty interesting community-made content, provided the tool is straightforward enough to use. In this week's content, we actually concentrate on the process of saving and loading quests from and to the local storage on the machine. Essentially, this will be creating a file which stores the dictionary containing our quest nodes data. And we've also taken a little bit of time to revamp and add additional items which your quest nodes are able to check. At the moment, the quest nodes are capable of uh, showing a character dialogue, player responses with the ability Ability to place multiple responses in a single dialogue response as well as the ability to grant an inventory item like gold or apples or whatever the heck you want to give the players at that point as well as check if the inventory contains a certain item in it this is for the uh, fetch quests or maybe collect uh, collect the nth amount of a certain item quest we also have the checks for and granting mechanics for the quest specific items meaning these are items which are granted in the background. They're placed in your quest uh, dictionary, which other quests are capable of checking for before initializing the quest as being started. The next steps would be to collect all the data as well as the connections between all the nodes and store them in the dictionary, which when you press save will essentially get stored on a local file. I should probably take some precautions and uh, establish some sort of an automatic backup system, which is essentially going to actively detect if there are changes in the quest file and back it up. Just in case I uh, work on some sort of a really lengthy quest and end up accidentally deleting or overriding it from within in the system. All of the work we've done for the Child of Ether right now pretty much uh, sits inside of this quest builder tool. And this tool is coming out uh, fairly flexible, which uh, kind of makes me think that I may or may not be able to use it in other games. For example, the Artag Rise project. That game is pretty quest heavy, and uh, the system I make here may allow me to also get it ported into that game and just populate the level with the quest using the same exact tool. This is perhaps the most important tool that I'm developing for this game, considering for an RPG game to have pretty lackluster and boring stories would be pretty disastrous. So having a tool that allows me to deploy stories into the game faster instead of sitting there figuring out how I'm going to hard code each and every story into the game, instead using this modular system will allow me to spend more time to study up on storytelling and uh, learn how to tell a good story as opposed to learn how to, well, make it play in the game. This is all that I have for the Child of Ether project for this week. Let's go ahead and move on to the next project. This week for the Accursed Kingdom project, we have uh, decided to completely revamp the battle mechanic or the attack mechanic for the sword. This time around, instead of the dinky wind-up thing that I tried to code uh, and create from within Godot Engine, this time around, we're going to commit to the Dark Souls-like attack method, where as soon as you click on the button, you basically commit to an attack which costs you a certain amount of uh, stamina, and realistically, the only way for you to cancel it is to basically take an axe to the face. And the end result came out eons better than whatever the hell of an excuse for an attack animation I had put in before. From this point on, for the attacks, I think I'm gonna stick to using Blender. Uh, I the animation player in Gadot is fantastic, but it has its limitations and it has a long way to go before I can consider it for everything. It was a great experiment, but Blender's animation tools simply get the job done faster. After getting the animations up and running, we end up adding a particle-based swoosh to the very tip of the sword, just so we can keep track of where the sword is located in three-dimensional space. 
It was also about the time I started considering the directions I need to take to get to a minimum viable product for this particular game. And uh, the first thing on the list is getting the enemies to actually take damage and follow you in the environment. We create a small heads up display for the enemies which shows up on both players camera at the same time. We program the damage mechanic for the enemies as well and at this point they can now perish if they lose too much health. We experiment a little bit with some sort of a visual indicator when an enemy dies, for example a spoof of particles floating in midair, which in the end provides you with the visual feedback that you have slain the enemy. Too many times I have found myself looking around in the level for where the heck did the enemy go when I realized that I'd actually killed it. Next on the list is the implementation of the stamina bar, as you can see in the top left corner. This will cost you stamina every time you swipe your sword with either the heavy or the quick attack. And as I mentioned before, I use a lot of templates. I use a lot of the existing games to borrow mechanics from. And in this case, when you do an attack, this is basically you committing to the stamina cost of that attack, as you cannot cancel attacks once you issue them. And yet again, we have to start thinking about the minimum viable product stage. What is the least I can program before it starts resembling what the final product of the game should be? What is the minimum functionality that you need to put into the project before it starts showing signs of uh, being its own standalone entity? In the case of this game, this would be the enemies following you and detecting you, dealing and receiving damage, as well as the player's inventory and item management system, crates and chests which contain items with randomly generated stats, being able to pick up, equip and wield multiple types of weapons, consuming items from the inventory like potions and applying special effects of the potions to the weapons and stats, and an array of different enemies which would provide a rich palette of combat scenarios and experiences. These are the things which I must create before this game can take on its self-sustained appearance. And what you see in these videos in front of you is actually only a portion of what we've achieved this week. As I said, I've recorded way more content, but due to the upload limits, I can only show you what is actually available on the platform as of right now. So I had actually gotten an inventory system up and running with the menu and nice transitions and whatnot, but uh, that will have to be shown in the next week's episode. Something that I did want to make a record of in this video is an idea that I got for a possible online co-op option. Now, I am a thorough fan of local co-op. I like to get together with my friends and play the game on the couch together in the same room. This whole game in front of you is a result of me imagining an interesting first-person medieval horror-based experience that I could play with Tim for Retroactive Gamers. But the more and more that I work with it, the more I realize that I will be aware of all the nooks and crannies and secrets of this game. So if I want to enjoy seeing the co-op experience play out, either I'd have to be a spectator sitting behind Tim and maybe Arya, who is another one of my friends, and observe them taking on the co-op experience for this game, or I'd have to find some other way of implementing a third character into the game. Now, the way the cameras are set up now is that it pretty much makes for a two-player split-screen game. If I make it into a four-player split-screen, that's just gonna look kind of gnarly. And I don't even want to start thinking about making this an online co-op experience game because netcode is hell. Netcode is a lot of work and all the time I would be spending developing netcode to make this game play in co-op over the internet, I could be spending developing new experience, new enemies and new stories or just working on a whole other game outright. The biggest hurdle is synchronizing the two games together, having one game run as a server and then dictate to the other game, the client game, what enemies are doing, where the enemies are located and uh, basically just manipulate everything that has to happen in one game to also trigger and happen in another. I've done enough netcode to know that I don't want to do netcode and yet I still think that there may be something that I could still program which may not be as tedious or as heavy, something that wouldn't count as you making two games in one, and yet still provide online experience with your buddies over the internet. And to find the solution to this, I once again look towards the giants of the industry, Dark Souls. 
Now, in Dark Souls, you have two interesting aspects. First, you can summon your friends. Second, you see ghosts of other online players running around the levels. Now, when you summon your friends, they are able to interact with all of the enemies in the level. However, what I wanted to do is perhaps a limited version of that. When you play with your friends, your friend shows up as a ghostly outline of the second character. You both, however, exist in your own worlds. You both exist in your own game. If you slay two enemies, the second player has not yet done so. The second player will have to slay those two enemies as well on his side. You do not see your friend's enemies and your friend does not see your enemies. However, whenever your friend lays a hit on an enemy, that enemy will momentarily spawn inside of the other player's game. Only for about a few seconds. Just enough time for the second player to try lay a hit and for that hit to be transferred back back to the other client. Now, this means that I don't have to track all the enemies in all the games and have them all synchronized perfectly. I just need to worry about mostly one or two enemies. When the player one lays a hit on the enemy, that message will be sent to the other computer and a new enemy will be spawned inside of the other player's container. However, that particular enemy will not be attacking the second player. He will only appear as a ghostly outline. An outline which can receive damage from the other player. However, as far as that enemy is concerned, that other player does not exist. This way, most of the challenge still remains on each of the player's computers. However, there's still some sort of a level of interactability going on between the two clients and their enemies, so player two still has a bit of a helpful hand in the battles of the first player. This is just an interesting idea. If anything, it could provide a little bit of netcode and a little bit of uh, online interactability, but in the end, you'll be able to play with your friends over the internet. This is all that I have for this week for the development content. If you're interested in seeing the detailed videos on the development for these games, head on over to the conceptbay.net, sign up for a membership, and you will get access to all the production videos for all of my projects. Thanks everybody for watching. I will We'll see you next week during the next content report.